Greetings in the name of Christ and welcome to Concord Matters, a show that seeks unity in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ, that by his word, through the study of the clear and concise teachings, confessed that we will come to that unity in studying the book of Concord. As Peter boldly confessed, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We boldly confess the truth of the entirety of God's inerrant word, nothing more and nothing less, all for the sake of a clear conscience in Christ. I'm your host, Brady Finnern, District President of the Minnesota North District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. Thank you for joining us on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. We continue to confess the scriptural truth of God's word um, from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. And we continue with Article 21, the Invocation of Saints. This is a subject that is still an issue for us today. Unlike several articles in the Apology where the Reformers could say, well, we agree. Uh, They said they agree, but here's some minor concerns. Or I shouldn't say minor concerns, but here are some concerns. This article was a complete disagreement. Personally, for me, one of my favorite Sundays is All Saints Sunday. So what does scripture say about saints? How are we to honor faithful believers who came before us? And where are where was the Roman church wrong and still wrong today? And the only way we do that is open up our Bibles and open up your book of Concord and confess the truth. If you have any questions concerning our study of the apology, send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, kfuo at kfuo.org. Joining us in the Confession of Christ, we welcome Pastor Dennis McFadden of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Pastor McFadden, welcome back to Concord Thank you. I'm glad to be with you. Well, let's just dig right in because this is a longer section of the articles and also very important. So we, once again, for you, our readers, we are, or, excuse me, our, our listeners, we are a reader's edition of the Book of Concord, the second edition, Concordia, the Lutheran Confessions, and we're on page 202. We'll begin with the note, Article 21, the Invocation of Saints. Melanchthon says that after numerous protests, all the confutation has done is prove that the saints should be honored and that living saints may pray for others, which is all the Lutherans said to begin with. In Roman Catholicism then and still today, the saints take on a non-biblical role. The saints are said to have a storehouse of merits that they use to intercede for us. Melanchthon provides a careful discussion of what a propitiator atonement maker, is and is not. Only Christ may be called the propitiator. Only the merit of Christ is counted as meritorious for us in God's eyes. This Lutheran assertion, then as well as now, stands in stark contrast to what Rome teaches about these things. Melanchthon rightly points out how, in popular devotion and practice, Mary has completely replaced Christ in minds of many. This is still very much a problem in the Roman in Roman Catholicism today. Pastor, what are some of the very, uh, I would say, serious situations and issues surrounding the invocation of saints then and also today? Well, it's it's interesting in the Augsburg Confession itself, it's all a very positive, forward-looking statement of what we believe, teach, and confess. When the Catholics came back and rejected the Augsburg Confession, and then Melanchthon put together the Apology it of necessity had to take on more of a negative cast because it was dealing with the objections of what he called the adversaries. But the heart of it uh, is a very positive one. And what needs to jump out at us, I think, in all 44 of these paragraphs is it's about Jesus Christ. He alone is supreme. He alone is the atoning maker, atonement maker. He alone is the mediator between God and man. He alone It's Christ alone. And that affirmation uh, rings even through these negative statements that are being made here. In fact, if you look at the entire apology, uh, you're going to find that the phrase, for Christ's sake, pops up 141 times. That is the theme. It is Mm -hmm. for Christ's sake. And what Melanchthon wants to do here is he wants to say anything that takes away from the uniqueness, the supremacy the one and only mediatorial role of Jesus Christ is wrong and it is soul destructive. And so that's really the the emphasis. He doesn't want us to impose or interpose any examples of Christian heroes, either biblical or in our in our history or our own day. He doesn't want us to put those kinds of stories on the same level 
as Jesus Christ, and he wants us to come away understanding that uh, for someone to be a propitiator, there needs to be a promise by God and a giving of merit, and that only applies to Jesus Christ. Now, let us let me ask you this. We could easily say, well, okay, so they say there might be a little bit of maybe help from the saints, but ultimately they still believe that Jesus you know, did the work but that maybe this is a little help. Is that really that big of a deal? Well, it's a it is a big deal because as as we know in our own experience, any time the sufficiency of Christ is challenged or taken away from any effacing of the sufficiency of Christ, always, always, always ends up leading to major problems, not just theologically, but but in terms of our own walk of discipleship. And for us to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, we need to be ever vigilant that we don't uh, slip into things that are going to cause us to uh, take away from the real uh, answer. It'd be a bit like saying, uh, if the doctor gives you a, a medicine to cure your ills, does it hurt if you water it down a bit? Does it hurt if you add some other things to it? Well, of course it does. You want, you want the genuine article. You want the real deal. You want Jesus Christ, not some cut right imitation. And that's why in this section, we're going to hear Melanchthon uh, telling us that the prayers that the Catholics were using uh, to Mary and the saints uh, had the effect of transferring people's loyalty away from what Jesus did to what they thought the saints did or what Mary did. And, and that was devastating. Well, let's dig in because this is such an important uh, article as we look at the Apology and also the Augsburg Confession. We confess, we're on page 202, article 21, the invocation of saints. Melanchthon writes, they absolutely condemn article 21 because we do not require the invocation of saints. On no other topic do they speak more smoothly or world wordily. Yet they are not able to prove anything other than that the saints should be honored or that living saints pray for others, as though invoking dead saints were necessary for that reason. They cite Cyprian because he asked Cornelius, while he was still alive, to pray for his brothers after his death. By this example, they prove the invocation of the dead. They quote also Jerome against Vigilantius. On this field, they say, 1,100 years ago, Jerome overcame Vigilantius. So the adversaries triumph as though the war had already ended. Nor do those <laughs> asses see that in Jerome against Vigilantius, there is not a syllable about invocation. He speaks about honors for the saints, not about invocation. Before Gregory, none of the other ancient writers mention invocation. Certainly this kind of invocation and the opinions that the adversaries now teach about the application of merits are not confirmed by the ancient writers. Pastor, what strikes me about this first part, I want to, next part we'll talk about how we um, faithfully see saints. But what fascinates me is this first part is that there's not scripture at all to be quoted as they're making their arguments. Uh, and you want to speak to that as, as this um, Th That's issue a theme. And, and Melanchthon begins by reminding us that many of these practices are not ancient. They, they're not in the New Testament. They're not in the early church. They are departures from the New Testament and departures from the early church that crept in hundreds of years after the closing of the canon. And so the effort to try to use uh, authorities and quotes from uh, famous uh, theologians in the past miss the point, he says, because they're, they, they don't prove what they think they prove, and they're very, very late quotes. And he wants to drive us back to Jesus Christ and to the Word of God. So let's get to how we faithfully look at the saints. We're on paragraph 4 on page 202. Our confession approves honoring the saints in three ways. First is thanksgiving. We should thank God because he has shown examples of mercy, because he wishes to save people, and because he has given teachers and other gifts to the church. These gifts, since they are the greatest, should be amplified. The saints themselves, who have faithfully used these gifts, 
should be praised just as Christ praises faithful businessmen, Matthew 25. The second service is strengthening of our faith. When we see Peter's denial forgiven, we also are encouraged to believe all the more that grace truly superabounds over sin, Romans 5. The third honor is the imitation, first of faith, then of other virtues. Everyone should imitate the saints according to his calling. The adversaries do not require these true honors. They argue only about invocation, which, even if it were not dangerous, still is not necessary. I love how Melanchthon breaks this down with the three ways that I still see today when you celebrate Mm -hmm. All Saints Day or you have a funeral. And these three ways, when you go to a Lutheran funeral, are very faithfully um, proclaimed along with, obviously even more so, the gospel. So the pastor, tell us about a faithful way to look at saints. <laughs> you anticipated me. That was exactly what I was going to say. I was going to go to the funeral and to All Saints Day. One of one of the most moving nice. uh, stories of All Saints Day that I've had with a, a member was a man whose wife died uh, an excruciating death through cancer that stretched out over years. And he loved his wife dearly. He they were such a close couple, and when she be- fell ill, it it devastated him, and her death devastated him. And then he told how on All Saints Day, when her name was read uh, and the bell was rung, and then when he came to the communion uh, 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 experience, and he realized that his wife was now part of the church triumphant and that in a sense he communed not only with the people in the pew but also with all those who have gone before us it gave him such a sense of of gratitude and thanksgiving for the gift god had given him of this wife and and it's appropriate for us to to turn to god in thanksgiving for the gift not only of the loved ones we have who have gone before us but also for the great uh exemplars of faith in our church history but then secondly, uh, it's useful for the strengthening of our faith because uh, Melanchthon uses the example of Peter's denial. We can see examples of Christian leaders who have failed in the past and yet through their failure and their repentance have been examples of not only the mercy of God, but the superabounding grace of God that overcomes even sin itself. And then thirdly, Uh, Paul famously in that chapter on the Lord's Supper, where he's correcting so many errors of the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 11, begins with that line, be imitators of me, even as I am of Christ. And there's that sense in which we look to those who have gone before us, first of all, to thank God for them. Secondly, to use even the negative examples in their life as as reasons to uh, strengthen our faith. And then thirdly, uh, to be imitators of them as they imitated Jesus Christ. And that is as as contemporary today as it was for the Apostle Paul when he said it to the Corinthians. And I love different parts of Scripture. For example, I was reading the Psalms recently, where it says in Psalm 115, Not to us, O Lord Yahweh, not to us, but to your name be all glory, for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. I think that's something of why we can at a funeral and why we can at All Saints Day uh, Sunday speak very faithfully of how God worked through these people and that how we can make sure that God's name is glorified, not our own, not because of our love, but because of the love of God. And that's what I love to be able to still speak about such things and make it very clear of that um the faithfulness of the full sufficiency of Christ, but also the faithfulness of how God worked with God's people. Now, that can be kind of tricky. Pastor, what are some things you want to uh, remind our listeners to be very clear on when we're doing such things like funerals and all saints? Well, we, we don't want to turn uh, the focus onto the individual at the expense of Jesus Christ. When we have a Lutheran funeral, mm-hmm. the thing that strikes me, uh, I probably did... Uh, 500 funerals as a Baptist. And then when I became a Lutheran, I noticed how different they were because the focus in so many uh, funerals in American Christianity is, is, 
you know, it's either a service, a celebration of life, or it's a, it's a, a rehearsal of, of how wonderful this person was. And sometimes you kind of listen to the eulogies and you look at each, at, at the person next to you and say, are we in the right service? I mean, who are they talking about? Uh, there's this kind of post-mortem uh, glorification of the worm uh, who is in the casket. And uh, it takes away from that focus on Jesus Christ. And I think that the thing I appreciate most about our Lutheran funerals is it gives comfort to the bereaved, not because it convinces them that their beloved was perfect, but it gives comfort to the bereaved because it focuses on the sufficiency of Jesus Christ, who is ever gracious and who promises uh, to forgive us because he was the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And that is very difficult. Now, how would you describe, um, can you break down a little bit? Because when you were doing a Baptist funeral versus a Lutheran funeral, obviously Christian funerals, would you would you write that? I mean, you say celebration of life versus... I did. I never liked um, celebration of life, but I uh, I did, right. uh, to, my, to my embarrassment and shame today, I did spend an awful lot of the service focusing on on uh, the reminiscing uh, about the life of the of the the person we were uh, there for the funeral about, and I think that the uh, I tried to focus on the sufficiency of Christ, but to be honest, I think that the proportion of emphasis on all of this wallowing and memory and reminiscence uh, uh, took away from the clarity of of the comfort we have in Jesus Christ. So whereas I tried not to succumb to turning it into a, 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 a reminiscing session, I will admit that by and large, it, it was a lot of that. I, I went to a funeral a year ago for a dear friend of mine, and it turned into a two hour and 30 minute uh, extravaganza where uh, one of the daughters stood up and talked for almost a half hour recounting every single Christmas gift she ever received and every single vacation they ever took and every single uh, play that her father took her to. And it was it was just, uh, it, it threw into stark relief how different. Uh, we grieve, but not as those who have no hope. We have a hope and it's it's grounded not in the perfection of the of the deceased, but in the uh, perfection and sufficiency of our Lord Jesus Christ. And just a reminder for you, our listeners, I would, first of all, pray for your pastors, as there's a lot of pressure to speak about the person more than Christ when you enter a funeral quite often, even of faithful Christian people. So pray for your pastors and also make it very clear for your pastor about what you want at your funeral. Uh, a very good reminder is to tell your pastor or for you to encourage your pastor is that, Pastor, I want to hear about <laughs> Jesus. It was such a comfort when I've had people who pre plan their funeral. And I had one particular saint uh, now with the Lord. To, he, he said, you talk about Jesus more than you talk about me in this funeral. And that was just a good reminder because our old Adam kind of leads to that. It was a good reminder for his family because <laughs> they want to hear more about him. And it also is that one last shot to be able to point them to the hope that, that he had and the hope that they have on that, that funeral. That, that's, so the, that, that's the reason, quite clear. frankly, I have two adult children who are pastors of very, very large congregations, non-denominational congregations uh, that run in the thousands. And I... I love my kids, but I wouldn't let them near my funeral for all the money in the world. I've, I've given very strict orders that I want my pastor to preach a Christ-centered funeral, and uh, they're going to sing uh, God's Own Child, I Gladly Say It, to make sure my mm. 20-something uh, offspring and, and grandkids hear a, a message of baptismal regeneration in my funeral. Well, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. I, I will have to come to that funeral. I look forward to it. So, not too anyways, soon. We, not too soon, the Lord's timing. Okay, we are, I want to continue because there is a very important <coughs> distinction that Melanchthon makes 
that we have to be very clear on. So when we look at the next two, next few sections, I want everybody who's listening to make sure that we are, first of all, looking at scripture. We make a very clear distinction of the prayer of the saints and our need to pray to saints. And then also to make sure that, like I said, that we're looking to scripture, not our own thought process, because that gets a lot of people in trouble in in American society. So we're on page 202. We are on paragraph eight. Besides, we also grant that the angels pray for us. There's a passage in Zechariah 1 verse 12, where an angel prays, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem? We admit that just as the saints, when alive, pray for the church universal in general, so in heaven they pray for the church in general. However, no passage about the praying of the dead exists in the scriptures, except the dream taken from the second book of Maccabees. Furthermore, even if the saints do pray for the church, that does not mean they should be invoked. Our confession affirms only this. Scripture does not teach the invocation of saints or that we are to ask the saints for aid, since neither a command nor a promise nor an example can be produced from the scriptures about the invocation of saints. It makes sense that conscience remains uncertain about this invocation. Since prayer should be made from faith, how do we know that God approves this invocation? Without the testimony of scripture, how do we know that the saints know about the prayers of each one? Some plainly ascribe divinity to the saints, namely that they discern the silent thoughts of our minds. They argue about morning and evening knowledge. Perhaps they doubt whether the saints hear us in the morning or the evening. They invent these things, not to honor the saints, but to defend profitable services. The adversaries cannot produce anything against this argument, since the invocation of saints does not have a testimony from God's word. It cannot be affirmed that the saints understand, or invocation, or even if they understand it, that God approves it. Therefore, the adversary should not force us into an uncertain matter, because a prayer without faith is not prayer. For they cite the church's example. It is clear that this is a new custom in the church. Although the old prayers mention the saints, they do not invoke the saints. This new invocation in the church is unlike the invocation of individuals. Now, I also want to skip here, Pastor, very quickly to turn to page 205 as it speaks about the saints praying for the church. If you go to page 205, number 27, this is what he says, which really brings the Lutheran a little bit like, "Uh uh-oh, what's going on? On page 205, it says, Granted, the Blessed Mary prays for the church. Does she receive souls in death? Does she conquer death? Does she make it alive? What does Christ do if the Blessed Mary does all these things? Although she is most worthy of the most plentiful honors, yet she does not want to be made equal to Christ. Instead, she wants to consider and follow her example. Pastor says here, okay, angels pray. This is Zechariah. But also, it kind of leads toward the saints pray. How are we to look at this as Lutherans? According well, to I, I see this more as a concession than as an argument, uh, since in popular piety, uh, the Virgin had taken over Christ's place at the time of Melanchthon. He's saying, okay, granted that Mary prays for the church. Uh, so what? I mean, if you want to say uh, Zechariah proves that that the angels pray for the church, well, sure, maybe, maybe the departed pray for the church generally too. Uh, there's nothing in the Bible that says they do, but there's nothing that says they don't. Uh, but, you know, let's, let's concede that. Okay, Blessed Mary prays for the church. But get to the point. Does she receive souls in death? Does she conquer death? Does she make alive? Is she our redeemer? Is she our mediator? No, there's only one mediator between God and man, the, the God-man Jesus Christ. So I, I see this as more of, a, of, a, of an argument of rhetoric where he's, he's saying, okay, I'll even concede your point. And even if that's true, it doesn't leave where you, where you take it. Because even if you can say that because the angels pray, maybe the saints pray, and Mary's a saint too, so maybe she prays, what does that mean? It She still doesn't receive people when they die. She doesn't conquer death. She can't make anybody alive. And you she can't take the place of Jesus Christ. So why are you doing this? So I see it more in that sense, I guess. 
I don't see it as, uh, I think as a Lutheran, uh, I have no, uh, I think the most important line was the one in number 10. Uh, there's neither a command nor a promise nor an example that can be produced from the scriptures about the invocation of saints. And I don't think there's a command or a promise or an example that can be produced that prove that the saints are involved in praying other than just we suppose it's true. And so I, I prefer to stick with Scripture. And according to Hebrews chapter 7, it is Jesus who is praying for us. And so if we really want to get down to it, okay, maybe they pray for us, but guess what? We have an even better intercessor praying for us, Hebrews 7 verse 25, which is Jesus Christ our Lord. So it's one of those realities that even if this is true, um, we have one that's yeah. even better well, that's and, praying for us. And, and, so and if you looked at if you look back at the Augsburg Confession, uh, particularly uh, in the in the Latin uh, uh, edition of it, it only has one proof text: First John two one. Now in the German, they add a few more, but that First John two one. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He mm-hmm. is our he is the intercessor and the advocate for us today in his heavenly session. And we can trust him because he is the one who made propitiation for our sins. Or to put it in simple English, he satisfied God. The word propitiation means to satisfy. And he satisfied God by his, by his bloody death on the cross. And now as our ascended Lord, he is our advocate with the Father based upon his propitiatory death. He has the right to advocate for us, and we don't need uh, any saints advocating for us. We have uh, the only one who could save us from our sin, the only one who could give us new life after death, and uh, he is our advocate even now. I would encourage you, our listeners, that if you want to get even more information of what we're covering today, go to a, a year ago. A year ago, we studied Worship of the Saints from the Augsburg Confession, as he mentioned, as it quotes scripture there, we have you have different editions that have a little different, uh, well, different emphases, I suppose you would say. And so just keep that in mind. But also it's, it gives you even a fuller picture as Pastor Ben Meyer and I studied um, the, the worship of the saints last year. So, Pastor, it's very clear that he says, OK, angels pray. Great. The saints might pray. But what is the main point that Melanchthon is always trying to make as we continue to plow through this? Uh, the article? supremacy of Jesus Christ and the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. As he says, here, honor belongs to Christ alone. That is the bottom line for him. That's why uh, he keeps saying, uh, for Christ's sake, all the way through the apology. It, it, it is all for Christ's sake, and it is all to Christ alone. Uh, Melanchthon emphasized that salvation is uh, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And that has to be highlighted even when he's dealing with his adversaries and trying to nitpick uh, or respond to their nitpicks of him. uh, He's still proclaiming and confessing uh, the gospel that that all honor belongs to Christ alone. With that in mind, we need to take our break. We are confessing the biblical truth on the invocation of saints from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. We'll be right back. Showing support for KFUO is now easier than ever. You can sport a KFUO shirt, swag, or even socks by visiting our online store. Go to kfuo.org slash store and order high-quality KFUO-branded merch. You no longer need to wait for our annual share for a chance to show your KFUO spirit. Visually share and wear this ministry out in the world by checking out our selection. Every purchase helps to support our proclamation of Christ for you, anytime, anywhere. Go to kfuo.org slash store. Welcome back. We are studying the scriptural truth concerning the invocation of saints from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession with Pastor Dennis McFadden of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Now, Pastor, this is something where we could easily say, I'm not so sure if this is still true. 
uh, if you, you know, okay, yeah, they have Saints. Okay, great. Uh, they have Mary. She's up there. Great. Do you think this is still an issue today in the Roman Catholic Church? I think it still is an issue in the Roman Catholic Church. The the prayers uh, that are used, uh, Hail Mary, full of grace, the, the last rites in the Roman Catholic Church uh, invoke Mary. And uh, there are, uh, Melanchthon gets kind of humorous in a later section of this when he starts giving examples of how uh, pagan Roman gods were viewed as the god of war, the god of peace, the god of love, the god that took care of the harvest, the god that took care of uh, epilepsy or whatever, and how a lot of the superstitious Christian writers began attributing to various dead Christian uh, individuals some of these same uh, godlike pagan concepts, and he, he mocks that. And says that, you know, why do you need that when you have Jesus Christ? You know, trust in trust in Christ's mercy. You don't need the mercy of saints. You don't need the mercy of, of Christopher or of, you know, some other uh, dead Christian. You have Jesus Christ, who's your advocate in heaven. Let's continue our confession. We're on page 203, sec- uh, paragraph 14. Further, the adversaries not only require invocation in worshiping the saints, but also apply the merits of saints to others. They make the saints not only intercessors, but also people who make atonement. This cannot be tolerated. Here, honor that belongs to Christ alone is completely transferred to the saints. The adversaries make them mediators and atonement makers. Although they distinguish between mediators of intercession and mediators, the mediator of redemption, they plainly make the saints mediators of redemption. Without the testimony of Scripture, they declare that the saints are mediators of intercession. This, be it said ever so reverently, still clouds over Christ's office and transfers to the saints the confidence and mercy belonging to Christ. People imagine that Christ is stricter and saints more easily appeased. They trust the saints' mercy rather than Christ's mercy. They flee from Christ and seek the saints, So they actually make the saints mediators of redemption. Therefore, we will show that the adversaries truly make the saints not just intercessors, but atonement makers, that is, mediators of redemption. Here we will not describe the abuses of the common people. We are still speaking about the opinions of the doctors regarding the rest, even the inexperienced can judge. In a person who makes atonement, two things are required. First, There should be a word of God from which we certainly know that God wants to pity and listen to those calling upon him through this atonement maker. There is such a promise about Christ. Whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you, John 16. There is no such promise about the saints. Therefore, consciences cannot be completely confident that we are heard by the invocation of saints. This invocation, therefore, does not spring from faith. We also have the command to call upon Jesus. Come to me all who labor, Matthew 11. In that day, root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, Isaiah 11. The people of Tyre will seek your favor with gifts, the riches of people, Psalm 45. May all kings fall down before him, Psalm 72. May prayer be made for him continually, Psalm 72. They all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father, John 5. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ and God of our Father comfort your hearts and establish them, 2 Thessalonians. What commandment, what example can the adversaries produce from the scriptures about the invocation of saints? The second requirement for an atonement maker is that his merits are shown to make satisfaction for other people. They are divinely given to others so that through them, just as they their own merits, other people may be regarded righteous. For example, when any friend pays a debt for a friend, the debtor is freed by the merit of another, as though it were by his own. So Christ's merits are given to us so that when we believe in him, we may be regarded righteous by our confidence in Christ's merits as though we had merits of our own. From both of those, the promise and the given of merits arises confidence and mercy. Such confidence in the divine promise and likewise in Christ's merits should be promoted when we pray, for we should be truly confident both that for Christ's sake we are heard, and that by his merits we have a reconciled Father. 
Pastor, this is quite a bit to break down. What do you want to? What do you want to highlight in that bl- really blessed? Well, I think section? I want to highlight the the fact that that of those two I, those two sides to it. Uh, my wife and I took a 50th anniversary trip to Europe last month, and while we were there, um, there were times we wanted to buy uh, souvenirs. There were times we wanted to have a, a meal at a at a sidewalk cafe, and you learn very quickly that there are two things you got to have. You gotta, you gotta know that the person who is running the place will accept the currency that you've got. You've got to have a word that they'll take it. And uh, they wanted to mm. see euros in most of the places we were. They didn't want to see any other currency. They wanted euros. So you got to know that they're going to accept your euro. But then also you got to have some in your wallet that you know that when you give them, it's going to do the job. And for an atonement to work, you've got to have a word from God that he will accept the currency that you're paying him. And there actually has to be a transaction where he grants uh, that that mercy to the atonement maker. And the that doesn't apply to saints. Saints are not able to offer atonement for our sin. They are themselves sinners. The only one in all of history who qualified to make atonement was Jesus Christ. And we have the word of God that says he will accept Jesus offering and we have Jesus making the offering. So we have the completed thing uh, in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. So the scripture says, come to me all you who labor. And the scripture says uh, that they be honored the son just as they honor the father. And all those verses he quotes there are illustrations of the fact that Christ's merits are truly given to us uh, and make full atonement for us. Mm. And so we have both elements of the promise and the giving of merits that he mentions uh, in uh, 17 and 20. It is it is very enriching, I would say, very comforting to see that definition of atonement I don't think I've quite seen it laid out in that way where it's very clear that, okay, all right, let's look at this. Is there the promise and the merit that this individual to make atonement is actually going to be able to do this? And so that that's a good analogy too, talking about Europe and, and, uh, and make an exchange. Cause that, I tell you what, I've traveled overseas and that's kind of terrifying. Like, do I even know (laughs) how to do this? And, and that can be terrifying, let's be honest, yeah. about salvation. Like, how do I even know I'm saved? Well, Scripture is very clear, and we know that we have that atonement in Christ and, and the merits that he's done, as it says, for Christ's sake. Pastor, anything else you want to highlight? No, that that, that, hi, that, that hits it for me. Uh, I, I, I keep coming back to that same idea of Jesus as our advocate, Jesus as the propitiator for our sins. Uh, I think there's a tendency in some... Uh, non-Lutheran Christian churches, and even in some Lutheran churches, to want to gainsay the cross of Christ and to say that uh, it wasn't necessary. God could have just up and forgiven without the cross. And I love Mm. the way that our confessions keep hammering away at that truth, uh, that we believe, teach, and confess that God has forgiven us because of the the, the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us. And it was for us that he died. And so against any who would try to say, well, you know, God is a, you know, God is a big guy. You know, he could just up and forgive. If someone comes to you and they've offended you and they ask you to, to forgive them, you could just up and forgive them. Why can't God just up and forgive us? And the scripture makes it pretty clear that without the remission of sin, uh, of blood, there is no, uh, forgiveness of sins. And we have forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ because of his death on the cross. And so his merits are applied to us. And that's the the theme that keeps coming up again and again and again in this section. I will encourage you, our listeners, that this section on page 204, the end of 19 through 20, is something that it, it encompasses everything that we believe. As, as Christians, when we look at all of scripture, when we look at we through the lens of your daily life, all of this. Um, so Christ's merits are given to us so that when we believe in him, we may be regarded righteous by our confidence in Christ's merit as though we had merits of our own. 
it goes back to you know the Augsburg Confession, apology of the just justification. All of that encompasses, brings it all together. So for me, I have it highlighted. I have it underlined. I have it asterisked. All this is right there. So I encourage you to keep that at the forefront of everything. And here's why. And Pastor, I want to hear your thoughts on this. There's been a number of young people that I've worked with who are very attracted to Roman Catholic, nice and neat order, tradition, and history. And so when I see this, like, for example, uh, on, on paragraph 14, further, the adversaries not only require invocation of worshiping the saints, but they also apply the merits of saints to others. Now, clearly, uh, one of the real appealing parts of your, i say, Roman Catholic and Orthodox traditions is that it looks neat and clean. I received... Um, I remember one time I was listening to Issues, Etc., and Will Whedon was talking about orthodoxy. And he said this, that always struck me, is don't compare orthodox ideals, or in this case, Roman Catholic ideals, meaning yeah, they, they have an order of service, they have long traditions, they highlight very cool things, they have a lot of great liturgy, all of this. Don't confuse that ideal, meaning they have it all neat and clean, and they got a big old book that you can read about this history, and it goes farther back in history than our Book of Concord. Don't confuse that with Lutheran reality. And I think that is so huge because I know a number of young people who are very attracted to Roman Catholicism and, and, and because they see it being looking very neat and clean. Here we see the requirements. You have to do this. And here's the other way. This plus this plus this equals that. For us, we don't ever want to lose AC4, right. Apology 4, what it just said here in 19 and 20. It can look so nice. And I tell you what, I love going to mass sometimes and just kind of seeing all the bells and whistles. Um, but also, if you lose the justification piece, you lose everything. Pastor, what have I, you noticed? I would agree and, uh, with and... everything you've just said. Uh, I would say, though, that uh, one of the things I appreciated coming from evangelicalism to Lutheranism was the fact that it doesn't just go back 500 years. We do go all the way back to the New Testament, and we never threw out uh, those bells and whistles. Uh, we kept what was good with the tradition, and we purged it of that which was wrong. And essentially, the one of the things that ends up attracting people to Catholicism is the same thing that ends up attracting so many of our of our uh, kids when they get out of high school and they go off to college and they go and they drift into non-denominational churches, uh, they have the same mm. draw uh, for a different reason. But the, mm. the draw is both Roman Catholics and American evangelicalism stress my works. I can actually do something that is going to get me credit with God. And the, and the mm -hmm. very same thing, the mm -hmm. old Adam wants to do something. The old Adam wants to contribute something. The old Adam wants to earn something. And with all of the pageantry and the beauty of the liturgy in the Catholic tradition, and with all of the excitement and the, the razzmatazz in evangelicalism, at base, both of them are appealing to the old Adam and appealing to the fact that I can do something that's going to count with God. And our Lutheran faith keeps reminding us, I am a poor, miserable sinner. I bring nothing to the table that can count with God. It is in Christ alone that I have my salvation. It is for Christ's sake that I am forgiven. It is through Jesus Christ that these blessings and benefits are transferred to me. And uh, I, I think that's an important point to note, how often the old Adam wants to drift either into a Roman direction or into a American evangelical direction. And despite the fact that their, their style of service is very different, the bottom line is very similar. Well, that's just a, a continued prayer for all of us. And what I want to make sure, too, is we're not making it sound like uh, you go to Lutheran church and there's no accountability needed for justification by faith. You know, we, we definitely need to be reminded to keep that at the heart. As pastor said, the old Adam wants to bring a little bit of our works 
into everything, which is actually what we highlighted uh, last week with uh, Professor John Pless talking about good works, which I encourage you to listen to as well. And and today, I just want to make that very clear. I've noticed this. I I would say in my past that I was kind of attracted to that, never to the point of maybe switching denominations or my confession or something like that. But it is something that was always very appealing to me until a dear mentor emphasized to me, Brady, if you lose justification, you lose everything, which really nailed me to the ground and, and reminds me every day of my need, as you said, as a poor, miserable sinner. Pastor, you ready to move on? All right. We're on page 204, uh, paragraph 21. Here the adversaries ask us first to invoke the saints. Although they have neither God's promise nor a command nor an example from Scripture, yet they incite greater confidence in the saints' mercy than in Christ's mercy. Although Christ has asked us to come to him and not to the saints. Second, they apply the saints' merits, just as Christ merits to others. They ask us to trust in the saints' merits as though they were regarded righteous because of their merits, just as we are regarded righteous by Christ's merits. We are making none of this up. In indulgences, the adversaries say that they apply the saints' merits. And Gabriel Beale, the interpreter of the canon of the Mass, confidently declares, according to the order instituted by God, we should be take ourselves to the aid of the saints in order that we may be saved by their merits and vows. These are Gabriel's words. Nevertheless, still, they, more silly things are read here and there in the adversary's books and sermons. What is this other than creating people who make atonement? If we must trust that we are saved by their merits, they are made completely equal to Christ. Where is this arrangement to which Gabriel refers when he says that we should resort to the aid of the saints been instituted by God? Let him produce an example or command from the scriptures. Perhaps they get this arrangement from the courts of kings, where friends must be used for intercessors. But if a king has appointed a certain intercessor, will he not want cases brought to him through others? So Christ, so since Christ has been appointed intercessor and high priest, why do we seek others? My first thought, and I want to hear yours, Pastor, is I think that last part in 24. So since Christ has been appointed intercessor and high priest, why do we seek others? is really the, the argument we continue to make as, as Christians when we speak on such matters. Well, that's, that's exactly what you and I have been saying this whole time we've been talking, is, is the supremacy of Christ. He is the appointed intercessor. He is the one who made atonement uh, through his blood. He is the one who advocates on our behalf. Why would you want someone else? When he invokes Gabriel Beale, uh, Beale fate was was probably the most influential theologian at the time of of Luther, and Beale famously said that if you do the best that is within you, God will will surely not turn you away. Which in in our language would be uh, try hard, do the best you can. God grades on a curve, and that that idea mm. puts all the emphasis on on my trying as hard as I can, and that's not the Christian message. The Christian message is not that I need uh, departed saints to intercede for me. It's not that I can somehow try really, really hard to squirrel up my religiosity and feel very religious in a worship service, and that's going to count with God. But it is it is Jesus Christ who is my appointed intercessor. He is my high priest. Why do I seek others? And I think it's, it's something very important for each of us, like Pastor said about the old Adam, is that we will sometimes, if someone were to ask us, you know, how do you know you'll be saved? We have to kind of fight, not looking inward <laughs> <laughs> and looking to our own works. And this is where I highly encourage, whenever I visit a congregation, part of my calling is to visit congregations when they go through a call process. The first question I do ask on the survey is, what is the gospel? And right there is kind of gets people perked up a little bit. Sometimes people are like, well, we all should know that. And you're right. You're right. We should know that. And then when you start speaking about, okay, where do you find your hope? Well, then things restart being fun because then people are talking Jesus language. Then they start talking about this. And that's where we always should be. But often we start talking about ourselves, what we've done, what the church has done, all of this. 
And what we forget often, much like in a funeral, is the full sufficiency of Christ. So why go to another? Now, I love this next section here. Pastor, I want to make sure anything else you want to highlight there before we move on. Okay. This next section brings to the forefront on how what we do as Lutheran Christians is looks a little bit different. And, and it's always good for you to be able to make that distinction. So here in verse in number 25 on page 205, here and there is form of absolution is used. The passion of the, our Lord Jesus Christ, the merits of the most blessed virgin and the saints and all of the saints be to you the forgiveness of sins. Here the absolution is pronounced on the theory that we are reconciled and regarded righteous only by Christ's merits, but also the merits of the other saints. Some of us have seen a doctor of theology dying. A certain theologian, a monk, was enlisted to comfort him. He pressed on the dying man nothing but this prayer, Mother of grace, protect us from the enemy. Receive us in the hour of death. Pastor, here's the absolution. The passion, I mean, from the Roman Catholic realm, especially in those days. The passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, the merits of the most blessed virgin, all the saints, be to you the forgiveness of sins. What would be different? if you went to a Lutheran divine service? Well, a Lutheran divine service is going to root the forgiveness of sins and the absolution in the finished work of Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And it will not brook any intrusion of human merit, whether it be the Virgin Mary or some uh, beloved Christian of of a previous generation. None of that counts with God. What counts with God is that for Christ's sake, And because of Christ's sacrifice, we are forgiven fully and freely. And so when the pastor stands and says, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, it is rooted in the finished work of Jesus Christ, not in the merit of Mary or a saint or even the merit of the the pastor. It's, It's exclusively based on Jesus Christ, who made propitiation for us. We don't accept any co-redeemer. I know at times Roman Catholics uh, uh, flirt with the idea of calling Mary the co-redeemer with Christ, and we, we find that to be abhorrent. Pastor, with a, just a few minutes left in our time, I want to go to the end of this article, to number 44, and kind of wrap this all together as we look at Article 21. We are on page 208, section, or excuse me, paragraph 44. Most excellent Emperor Charles, for the sake of Christ's glory, which doubtlessly you wish to praise and magnify, we beg you not to agree to the violent advice of our adversaries. Rather, we beg you to seek the other honorable ways of establishing harmony so that godly consciences are not burdened, that no cruelty is exercised against innocent people, as we have seen before and that the sound teaching is not hindered in the church. To God above all, you owe the duty to preserve sound teaching and hand it down to future generations, to defend those who teach what is right. For God demands this when he honors kings in his own name, calling them to God, saying, I said you are God, Psalm 82. They should work toward the preservation and growth of divine things. That is the gospel of Christ on the earth. As God's representatives, they should defend the life and safety of the innocent. He ends the time speaking very directly to Emperor Charles and why this is important. So why was it important then and why has it continued to be important today? Well, it was important then because church and state were were connected in a way they're not now. Uh, But the appeal to the emperor was an appeal for the sake of Christ's glory. And uh, it's unfortunate that Charles rejected uh, the apology. He would not accept it. And yet because Uh, Melanchthon took the time to put into writing uh, the elaboration on what was meant by the uh, Augsburg Confession. We have in our Book of Concord today this magnificent statement uh, of Christian faith and this summary of what we believe, teach, and confess so that we're able to study it today, we're able to look at it today, we're able to uh, remind ourselves of what the stakes are. We live in a time when we people around us either deny that there is a God, or if they accept that there's a God, they think that somehow their works can contribute to their standing with him. And we have in this section 
a glorious statement that it is all about Christ's glory and it is for the sake of Christ's glory uh, and Christ alone. Pastor Dennis McFadden of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana, clearly confessing the truth of the invocation of saints from the Apology of the Augsburg Confession. Pastor McFadden, thank you for being thank our you. guest. I'm your host, Pastor Brady Finner. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hand. Amen.